Our final speaker today is Dr. Benjamin Hobbs, who's coming to us from uh, Johns Hopkins University, where he is the director of the Johns Hopkins Environment, Energy, Sustainability, and Health Institute, ESHI. Uh, he's also the Theodore M. and K.W. Shad Professor of Environmental Management. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, a topic that was alluded to earlier by Dr. Mann, uh, an electrification of the grid. So uh, let's all give a welcome to Dr. Hobbs. Thank you, Jen. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Um, that's great. So uh, given that we're um, a few minutes behind, should I trim my talk? Do we have a hard stop at uh, 1233? 5% faster wouldn't hurt. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, all right. Well, thanks very much. Um, so um, I teach at Johns Hopkins, as, as Jen said. I also chair the Market Surveillance Committee for the California Power Market. I've been on that committee for uh, 20 years since the, the crisis. And um, during that time, we've advised the state of California how to uh, maintain reliable power while um, in integrating the flood of renewables and now battery storage that are coming in and also attain uh, carbon dioxide reduction goals. California has had the most ambitious goals for all of these among uh, all the states, and it has been a, a fascinating challenge. And I'm going to talk about um, some of the issues, and in particular, um, whether market design needs to be entirely rethought or whether the fundamentals of power markets uh, still apply in this new future where we have a lot of non-dispatchable variable renewables and storage and distributed energy sources as opposed to what we designed the power system for in the first place 25 years ago, which was a predominantly thermal fossil fuel dispatchable system. So let's see, um, there we go. And um, after an introduction, I'll talk about the old market design that we implemented about a quarter century ago. Um, and then we'll talk about the challenges that new technologies present to that market design and discuss the question as to whether we should throw the whole thing out and start again, or would, whether we should continue to make uh, incremental changes. And I'll talk about a number of those changes. So first of all, why do we have markets for power at all? This is not what Edison and his accountant Samuel Insel uh, uh, envisioned uh, 140 years ago. This is the Power Administration and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, why do we have competition for electricity generation when to many people this seems like a monopoly function? Well, the, the major motivations have been apparent inefficiencies in what's been built, how it's run, and finally in pricing. So for example, in the United Kingdom in the early 1930s, power plants were using twice as much fuel as the state-of-the-art plants at that time could use. And so the UK went away from um, a centralized uh, government-directed approach at that time to take open, to take bids from folks possible and uh, the resulting heat rates, the rate of uh, fuel use per um, uh, megawatt hour wound up falling by uh, 50%. And of course, you all know about whoops, the Washington Pu Public Power Supply System and many other uh, nuclear cost overrun disasters in the US in the 1970s, 1980s, and in fact, continuing even to this very day in the Southeast United States. So the hope is that uh, investments would be made more efficiently. These plants were poorly maintained. Um, the outage rates for nuclear power plants in the United States were dreadful. Um, you have the wrong plants being operated because there wasn't a profit incentive. And there just wasn't as much efficient trade uh, between, for example, wind-rich areas in Wyoming and solar-rich areas in the Southwest as you could have. And finally, pricing. The price of power did not reflect the cost of producing it. And so large customers who had alternatives, they could self-generate or bypass the system, were taking those alternatives. All those resulted in pressures to 
um, deregulate the power industry. And what happened is that, uh, well, first of all, in the United States, the, uh, under President Jimmy Carter, we had the Public Utilities Regulatory Policies Act, which was the camel's nose under the tent. Small generators, less than 50 megawatts, or generators that use renewable energy could then sell to the local utility. The local utility could not say no. And then came along some people, we saw a, Mar a picture of Margaret Thatcher earlier. Some people through political will said that we can't do things as we had in the past. Um, this was not due to careful study or anything else, but just a gut instinct that um, uh, governmently owned power plants had served the UK badly. And so she privatized, but there were also scientists including uh, the control engineer, Fred Schweppe of MIT, who proposed frameworks for running a system where competitor, where generation could compete against each other um, and prices could be sent to consumers, to generators, to storage facilities, to help coordinate and uh, incentivize efficient operation and, and efficient investments. So that intellectual framework, along with some political will, wound up in over half the United States um, unbundling and deregulating its electric power system by the year 2000 when the California power crisis happened. Uh, Enron and its ilk uh, wound up figuring out a way to raise prices greatly at the expense of California consumers. So the map of deregulated areas that we saw in uh, 2000 is basically the map that we have today. Um, half of the U.S. is deregulated and half is not. And we can talk about um, what's happened to Enron and those problems uh, since then. Um, they have been largely solved, but the Southeast and the Pacific Northwest have very cheap public power, TBA, BPA, Seattle City Light, and uh, don't have a lot of motivation to deregulate that you have in more expensive parts of the country. So um, the question that I'll be asking is whether the deregulated market designs that we had for a world of dispatchable fossil units, is that fit for purpose today when we have rapid technological change? The energy transformation is happening, as, as Michael described. We're going from uh, dispatchable fossil resources to um, uh, variable um, and largely undispatchable renewables, um, battery storage, um, that links markets over time that the way the thermal power plants didn't. So to determine whether you should charge or discharge a battery now, you have to think about what might happen several hours from now. That wasn't true with old time power plants. And finally, we have uh, demand response um, and also distributed resources either on your roof or uh, on the distribution system that weren't there 25 years ago. Yes. I think he's lost complete connection. Um, I'm trying to email him.
I feel like there's a joke here about regulating Wi-Fi as well as the electrical grid. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully we will um, get him back in just another minute here. I, I'm emailing him now. Oh dear. Well, hello, everybody. Um, can anybody Welcome hear back. You? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I have no idea where I got, at what point I got bounced out of the room. Would you be able to actually stop your video? Maybe that would help ensure a better connection since the video is a little spotty. Okay, how's that? Perfect. Um, so could you uh, try to share slides again? Here we go. Beautiful. So probably back up a couple slides. You, you were down for about five minutes. Yeah, my, my apologies for that. I'm not sure what went awry, but anyway. Um, so I was talking about the, dr the dramatic uh, decreases in um, the cost of re renewables and of storage. And so the question is, um, can the markets handle these drastically different technologies from what the, uh, uh, compared to what the market was designed for? Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the goals and principles of uh, market design. And let's see, I am going to, excuse me, just a second. Um, all right. I just want to make sure I don't lose Zoom again. Um, so the goals of market design are, first of all, to maximize the net economic benefits or minimize the cost of providing energy and meeting reliability and environmental standards. And, and, and Michael mentioned that, you know, very important development is a shift in focus from, um, uh, uh, from economics to ethics, um, uh, when he showed the picture of Greta. And I agree that's an appropriate focus, but that's not to say that economics aren't important, because if we uh, spend twice as much as we need to, to achieve our uh, decarbonization goals, um, there are two risks. One is, is that we'll have less money for other important societal goals, such as say healthcare for all. And second, um, regulations that are more burdensome than they need to be, um, have a risk of collapsing of their own waste, uh, uh, of their own weight and not being achieved. We can achieve decarbonization faster if we do it efficiently. So uh, one set of goals is the economic goals. The other set of goals um, is a social cohesion and consent. And the principles that flow from those include, um, on the social side, we need implementable designs that people largely agree there are benefits to uh, having. And second, uh, we can pursue the social goals of reliable power, access to power for all, and uh, decarbonization at a reasonable cost. I'm going to focus on the economic goals here and uh, how we run the markets and whether the new technologies and new goals means that we need to completely rethink this. So the basic principles are that, uh, first of all, we need power prices that reflect um, actual costs of producing the power, including the cost of meeting the social goals, and that supports uh, optimal decisions. That is, the incentives to private party line up with social benefits and costs. Um, second, we need, need time consistent incentives uh, to minimize cost. That is, the profitability of investments should reflect the value and costs incurred in the short run markets when you actually operate uh, these facilities. If you have inconsistent um, operations with uh, investment incentives, uh, you can build a lot of stuff that's actually not very beneficial. And finally, we need to efficiently manage uncertainty. So let's dive in a little bit more about uh, pricing. 
Um, the offers from batteries, from, uh, from suppliers, need to reflect their true internal costs, which means in part, um, you don't want Enron uh, manipulating uh, prices and lying about what their costs are. Um, also, it's necessary that you clear the market, the bids from demand and the offers from supply, considering the full transmission network um, with an optimal amount of detail and scope over space and time. What we do in New York affects uh, the power system in Ontario, and in fact, in theory, all the way down to Key West and all the way up to Quebec. And what you do now also affects the power system this evening and later in the week and even later this year because of energy storage. And finally, we want a level playing field for entry. So if somebody invents a better mousetrap that does the job of decarbonization more cheaply, they can actually make a profit and come in. Uh, let's skip the discussion about risk, except I will point out that the extreme events of Texas last year or Hurricane Maria are something that we need to plan for and we can't just leave to the market. So let's apply these principles. Let's look at what we did um, uh, uh, 25 years ago. Um, so uh, we designed short run markets and long run markets. The short run markets figure out how you operate the power system today. And uh, for example, um, uh, we have two settlement systems because some decisions have to be made day ahead to procure fuel, to, to figure out which large power plants to start up and shut down. And then you need real time markets because forecasts are always wrong. The amount of solar energy we forecast for tomorrow may be quite a bit different than what actually occurs. Uh, we need uh, to co-optimize uh, consider all the operating decisions at once because one affects the other. Where you get the energy, where you get the operating reserves to back things up, and what transmission you use uh, interact, and the only efficient and reliable way to operate the system is to co-optimize. Um, supply offers in the United States reflect internal constraints, for example, ramp limits. Uh, that's not true in Europe. We have to very detailed network models because we don't want to schedule generation in a way that you can't deliver it. This is one of the mistakes that was made uh, before the California crisis is that we simplified the network and that we had infeasibilities which Enron exploited. Uh, another uh, implementation of the principles is that energy is bought and sold at time changing location specific prices, marginal prices called locational marginal prices, LMPs, that support optimal dispatch. And what um, that means is that the best way to operate the system is also the most profitable. And finally, because of the Enron episodes and others, we have local power uh, market power mitigation. So if you are trying to exploit the market and you raise your bids, for example, and you have local market power because there are transmission bottlenecks, say, into New York City, the market operator can reset your bids to marginal cost, which in the old days is easy to figure, the price of gas times the efficiency. In the long run, we have resource adequacy markets to make sure, to ensure that the, uh, the, the power capacity is there, um, that there's a commitment to building things, and that revenues that may be missing in the spot markets because we have price caps, um, are provided in the long term. This also mitigates market power because if you've sold power ahead of time at a price, then you can't manipulate the spot markets as what happened in California. So let's talk about the implementation of these um, uh, locational marginal prices and where they come from. So the locational marginal price comes from an optimization model that the operator uses to determine what power plants to run. Uh, these are sometimes called shadow prices, and they're associated with every node in the network. Every node in the network has an energy balance and basically reflects the increase in cost that is incurred if you want one more megawatt at a particular location. This optimal power flow, like any optimization problem, has an objective function, 
We're maximizing net benefits to the market, consumer value minus supply costs, subject to decision variables. What do you control? What are the joysticks? Well, how do you produce power? Discharging and charging batteries. Which demand bids do you accept? Uh, where do you get your backup power? And how does the power flow in the network? And the values of these X's are constrained by physical constraints, the physics of, for example, Kirchhoff's laws, capacity constraints, how much power can flow through a power line, um, how you can operate the facilities, how fast you can put the pedal to the metal and ramp up a power plant in case the wind stops. Operating reserve requirements and environmental requirements as well. Uh, we can skip this, but the result is that you have prices that vary a lot over time to reflect scarcity. They also vary over space to reflect how easy or difficult it is to get power to a particular location because of losses or capacity limits. So uh, Michael mentioned the uh, August 2020 heat wave in California where Death Valley set a world record for temperature of 130 degrees. This is what was happening in the power market then that um, power prices, which are typically 20 to $30 in the power market, leapt upwards to hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Um, they were a different day ahead than in real time uh, for reasons that we can talk about. But the idea is that you're giving incentives for um, um, uh, demand to reduce itself and for every possible source of supply and uh, stored energy to produce energy in the system when the prices are up here, rather than with the prices are down here, then uh, for example, consumers like ourselves, we can pre-cool our homes before the start of the day because prices are low. That is if we see those power prices. Now, LMP was invented by Fred Schweppe, and interestingly, his vision was that, first of all, consumers would be the ones who would have the incentive to use power more efficiently by having dynamic and spatially varying prices. It was only later that he thought about coordinating unregulated generation. And his mathematics is, are now the basis of all power markets in the United States, the standard market design. And what is pretty cool about the mathematics is that, at least in theory, it shows that the solution to the optimal power flow is equivalent to the solution of a competitive market, that is a market without Enrons, in that the dispatch will be efficient, it'll be the least cost way of meeting all the demands and all the constraints of the system. And in fact, long run investment will also have efficient incentives. This is under certain heroic assumptions. You know, all, you all know the joke about uh, the economist in the desert island who has a can of food they, uh, they can't open, and they said, well, let's assume a can opener. Well, uh, not all the assumptions are, are rigorously followed, but if they're a good approximation, we basically take the supply of energy, more energy will be provided at a higher price, and cross it with demand that consumers will buy less, and you'll get a, an equilibrium price and quantity. Uh, these locational marginal prices support the optimal solution. So if all batteries, all uh, power plants are paid the LMP for the energy and reserves they provide, then, um, um, then the optimal solution is also the profit maximizing solution. Social benefits and costs align with private benefits and costs. So here's the can opener assumption uh, that uh, are necessary for the, this really nice result, that we don't have price caps, we don't have Enrons floating around, uh, and may they rest in peace. Um, we have perfect information. So a battery now knows that the price will be higher at 8 p.m. tonight and won't discharge, or maybe will charge to save the energy for that time. That's not actually the case. Um, there's some mathematical conditions that we can talk about since we have physicists in the audience. If you're interested in convexity, glad to address that. And of course, I'm assuming that you could actually compute this for tens of thousands of power lines and thousands of generators at once. And fortunately, we can. We do this every five minutes in the large power markets. Now, there are still some challenges that we have to deal with. We have a dumb grid in that 
consumers don't know what the cost of power is at any particular time, so we use power when we shouldn't. We don't have, for example, an incentive to pre-cool our homes. Only 5% of homes are in time varying rates. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on smart meters in California, and we don't hardly use them for anything except for uh, a meter reading. And finally, we have terrific uh, discrepancies between retail prices, what you and I pay for the meter, and what the, uh, the value is of power on the high voltage grid, which results in all sorts of bad incentives. So strong incentives to put expensive solar panels on your roof rather than cheap solar panels in the desert, for example. Um, the market is also missing information for later times and elsewhere. When you operate the system in New York, you don't think about what's going on in Ontario. When you discharge your battery now, you don't know what the value of energy would be this evening if you held on to it. Um, we have non-convex costs, which we can talk about if you're interested. Um, flexibility is undervalued. So when the wind goes away, or a cloud passes over the sun, or transmission line uh, short circuits, we need to ramp up some other uh, source of energy to make up for that. That flexible generation doesn't have a strong incentive now to be there because we average prices over hour long day ahead settlement periods. And we also don't explicitly consider uh, uncertainty in market models. And finally, investment is also driven much more by policy than by spot prices. So that's why we're still seeing extremely expensive nuclear plants being built in the Southeastern United States, for example. All right, how are these principles in the market design, uh, uh, um, uh, how does that change these principles? Is the old market design fit for purpose? That is, do we have, um, it's, it's argued that the present market is inadequate incentives for decarbonization. Um, it fails to reward the flexibility you need to back up varying renewables. We're still missing the demand side. It's like going to a grocery store and just taking, say, a steak off the shelf and having no idea whether it's $3 a pound or $30 a pound that day, and then being very surprised at the end of the month. Um, and finally, we have the wrong horizons for battery storage. We're operating the, the real-time markets as if we only need to look an hour ahead. In fact, we need to look almost day ahead. Um, so this is the same diagram I showed before, and I wanted to point out that a lot of things are changing. For example, the cost of a battery is not the cost of fuel. It's the cost of recharging it, which depends on when you recharge it. Or it might be the revenue you give up because you sell the power later rather than selling it now. Um, these interdependencies are growing as, for example, California over, uh, has a lot of solar power in the middle day and then wants to sell it elsewhere. Um, at any rate, there are a lot of challenges in several of these, but I'm going to argue that uh, the fundamental principles of location module pricing and resource adequacy in the long, in the long run still can be used. Um, let's skip the whole next section of the talk, which is about how high wind and solar penetration will affect LMPs. Um, the naive view is that you'll have either zero prices because you have excess, or you'll have shortages because it's dark and the uh, wind has stopped blowing, what the Germans call the Dunkelflaute, a long period where you have no wind, it's really cold and no sun. Um, the reality is that the distributions of prices will change, they will be more volatile, but there are a lot of reasons why we won't just see zero or very high prices, we'll see prices in between, because we're still gonna have backup power, hopefully uh, subjected to either carbon capture and storage or using biofuels. Um, we'll be using excess solar power for making hydrogen or converting carbon dioxide to methane or making cement. Um, we'll have scarcity that starts to kick in before you actually run out of power. So you'll have in between prices that say, hey, it'd be great if you saved energy now because we can stick more in the battery in case there's a shortage tonight. Um, and finally, 
if we have correct battery uh, models of battery storage, if we account for degradation when you have uh, deep drawdowns, we will also see prices that are in between the bang bang uh, levels of either zero or extremely high. So I don't think a lot's going to change. You've all seen the California duck curve, which I think looks more like an oyster catcher to me. Um, so in the middle of the day, net demand is quite a bit lower because we have a lot of solar power. And that has resulted over the last few years in low and sometimes negative prices in the middle of the day and higher prices when the sun goes down. But the prices still reflect the cost of power and can still be used to manage the system. Most systems are seeing, um, this is across the United States, are seeing more frequent periods of zero or negative prices, but not all systems. Um, this, these are projections of what might happen in the future. This shows that for 5,000 hours out of the year, so that's about 60% of the year, at least this particular study predicts zero prices. So, um, but in fact, more sophisticated studies have shown that things like battery storage and uh, providing the backup reserves you need to deal with fluctuations will tend to decrease the periods of zero prices and result in more in intermediate prices. And in fact, an MIT study has looked at the classic models that Schweppe put together and um, included variable renewable energy and storage, and they conclude that just like what Schweppe predicted 25 years ago, that these models can incent efficient operations and an eff efficient investment, and we should not completely redesign the markets. Well, uh, Bill Gates was invoked before, and some of you may remember fondly Windows Vista and what a disaster it was. And um, uh, um, um, somebody who worked for Bill Gates told him that Vista was a disaster, and we really need to start from scratch that you should stop kludging using duct tape and, and bailing wire. And so the question is, does this apply to power systems today? Do we need a Windows 7 for power systems that works with batteries and variable renewables? So um, I'm going to be concluding by giving you an overview of some alternative long run market design strategies of what we did in California. One is to continue to kludge to continue to adjust the system. And that's what we've actually done in California, and that's what I'll argue for. Um, some say we need a European style system with longer time horizons to buy and sell power and a lot of intraday settlements, not just day ahead in real time, but intraday settlements because the forecasts of solar and wind are much better four and six hours ahead of time than they are 36 hours ahead of time. Uh, but it's hard to mitigate market power in that case. Others have argued that we should sell power like we sell phone plans. That is, you pay a fixed price and get power for free up to a, a certain limit. But as I showed before, we're still going to have significant short run costs. And so that's an invitation to have uh, a much more expensive power than we need to because we won't operate the system efficiently. Some people said we need long run planning. 20, 30 years where we take bids to build the transmission lines and the power types that we think that we need and, and sign long-term contracts. But we have huge uncertainties. Anybody remember the Committee on Nuclear and Alternative Energy Systems of the National Academy of Sciences? In 1980, they said, forget about wind. It's never going to be important. It's geothermal that's going to provide renewable power. There are so many surprises ahead of time. We can't use a long run planning process. That's just a recipe for a lot of lot more uh, nuclear type overruns. The proposal I like somewhat is one for clean energy forward procurement, where in addition to having auctions for um, energy and uh, capacities we now have, we also have an auction for clean energy credits that anybody who buys and sells power is obliged, is obliged to buy. Um, this is actually mathematically very similar to the cap and trade systems that Europe has for CO2 that we have in 
regional greenhouse gas initiative in California, but under another name, and maybe that makes it more acceptable, but it's also more complicated. Um, I was going to tell you about what California does um, uh, incrementally, um, but I guess it's a good time to um, uh, end here and point out that the, model, the markets we designed 25 years ago haven't quite worked out the way that we thought. It's not really driving efficient investments, but has resulted in a lot of improvements in operations. It's focused on supply and not uh, Fred Schweppe's original um, uh, vision of demand. The new technologies don't pose any fundamental challenge to the theory of locational marginal pricing. We can still run spot markets generally the way we did, but we need to tweak them to look ahead further. We need to tweak them to, uh, to provide more flexibility in the system, but those are more tweaks, kludges, if you will, rather than fundamental reforms. And finally, um, I believe that if we can't get federal legislation that mandates uh, a carbon tax or carbon cap and trade, that this is the this clean energy auction is the second best way uh, to go about it. It can be compatible with the present uh, market frameworks that we now have. And with that, I welcome you to visit our, our website where we have a lot of materials on, on power markets and their evolutions and their, and their challenges. And if any of you are interested in the references or having a copy of this presentation, please um, uh, email me. You can just Google me at Hopkins and uh, get my email. And um, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm sorry for the interruption that I had before. Thank you. Open up for questions. So I can start. We talked a little bit about um, federal legislation, but I'm wondering, do you see that state level legislative efforts might have some impact or is that kind of going to be um, just not as effective because part of what you alluded to is relying on uh, the transmission of power between states. So do you think individual states could have some effect if they're able to pass legislative efforts? So absolutely. I think it's, um, um, as, as a, from a political economy point of view, having uh, state legislation, spotty state legislation that's inconsistent, it may drive economists uh, uh, crazy. Um, in part because it's not an efficient way to meet greenhouse gas goals at all, but it's a, as, as with the Federal Clean Water Act, the, the uh, Federal um, uh, Clean Air Act, um, these were passed in order to make the, the federal system more rational and consistent um, and to prevent uh, states from beggaring their neighbors and the nightmares that happen from having uh, inconsistent regulations. So it's an important spur to, fe to federal legislation. Um, and locally, it can make a difference. So California has lowered its carbon dioxide emissions as a result, and other states have too. We're seeing a lot of innovation in technology, in part because of the experience that we're gaining. But um, I've also seen, and I I've actually studied this problem in California, that You've got a west-wide Mexico to Canada power market, um, but you've got a state that uh, limits CO2. And as a result, that pushes power production out of expensive California to the states like Wyoming and Montana, where coal plants, where there are no carbon limits now. So this is called leakage or contract or contract shuffling. And as a result, state regulations are not near as effective as people think they might be. And attempts to uh, regulate imports, um, to ascribe carbon content to imports, are just are bound to fail. It's just not going to provide very much incentive for Montana and Wyoming uh, to clean things up. So we really do need federal legislation if we're going to afford 100% decarbonization in the long run. But there's an important short-run leadership role, technology stimulation role, that I definitely Courage. Thank you.